I'm not dressed. I'll be right down. All right. So who exactly do we have today? All right. And so we have Saran. We have Caroline. And maybe David. Maybe he was serious. Yeah. Maybe he does have to get dressed to come out. <laughs> And and somebody needs to tell the them house. how the internet works. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's much funnier this way. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip. CodeShip is a hosted continuous delivery service focusing on speed, security, and customizability. You can set up continuous integration in a matter of seconds and automatically deploy when your tests have passed. CodeShip supports your GitHub and Bitbucket projects. You can get started with CodeShip's free plan today. Should you decide to go with a premium plan, you can save 20% off any plan for the next three months by using the code RubyRogues. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid-state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code RubyRogue, you'll get a $10 credit. This episode is brought to you by Braintree. If you're a developer or manager of a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out Braintree. Braintree's new V0 SDK makes it easy to support multiple mobile payment types with one simple integration. To learn more and to try out their sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash rubyrogues. Welcome to the Ruby Rogues podcast. This is episode 216. On our panel today, we have Coraline Ada Emke. Hello from Chicago. Saranya Barak. Hey, everybody. David Brady. Hey, so normally I do a joke here, but I need to do an announcement. But I have to do a joke here. So Cover My Meds has put up the world's largest Ruby logo. Are we compensating for something? Come work for us to find out. Uh, we are looking for Java and .NET programmers now to come learn Ruby. So I'll talk more about that in the pics. So those of you who listen to the show that don't do Ruby... We, you know who you are, and those of you who listen to the show that turn the show off before the picks, you know who you are. Listen to the picks. Well done. I saw a picture of the poster, and uh, it made me want to learn Ruby. So It's monstrous. <laughs> yeah. Well, joining us today is a special guest, Derek Pryor. Derek, um, would you mind introducing yourself uh, for a moment? Sure. I'm a developer at ThoughtBot here in Boston. Uh, I also co-host the Bike Shed podcast, which is a technical podcast about Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, whatever it is we're doing that week uh, with my friend Sean Griffin. Also, I love that show. Oh, great. Good to hear it. Uh, the reason I'm here today is I, RailsConf, I gave a talk about code review cultures and how to do code reviews well and what you can get out of them when you do them well and what code reviews are good for and what they're not good for, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's probably why I'm here today. So code reviews, those are the things that we stopped doing when we started pair programming, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's so code reviews mean a lot of different things to some to a lot of different people. There's people who have been doing development for a long time for whom code review means like you get in a room, you put the code on a projector and you go through every change in a release kind of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm I'm more talking about a modern process. Modern code review isn't really my term, but it is actually a term referring to like reviewing a change asynchronously with some sort of automated tool. Uh, in our case, it's like GitHub pull request reviews would, would be what most people are familiar with, I think. And people ask all the time, like, do I need to review code if I'm doing pair programming? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think it's those are 
different practices. If you only have two people on your team and you paired on it, obviously it's difficult to get a review. But having a third person review that wasn't involved in that entire, the thought process that led to your solution, right? To see if it stands on its own async, uh, stands on its own alone from the process that led, that led you down that path. Is Derek, important. what happens when you don't do code reviews? Yeah, what happens when you don't do code reviews? I'm in a situation right now where I am the only developer on a project and I can sometimes pull in some um, of my ThoughtBot coworkers to review changes. But I have to make a decision about whether or not I want to bother them with this particular change or not. So what happens when you don't do code reviews? First of all, you, there is an element of quality that uh, you can get out of a code review. I don't, I try not to stress that and actively avoid stressing that. So that's one thing you do miss out on, but that's lesser, I think. The, the bigger thing is that you are now the only one that's familiar with the change that you introduced, right? So you don't have that knowledge sharing benefit that comes from doing code reviews um, with everybody where, um, you're going to get like somebody else might have a different take on the problem or may have some additional background that, you know, wasn't previously exposed, some information about the, the problem that you're not aware of. Or you might be able to but just by showing the code to somebody else, you're making them familiar with it so that if there's a problem with it next week when you're on vacation or, you know, you're working on something else and you really don't want to step back to revisit this code you wrote last week, like everybody's familiar with those types of solutions. So there's all sorts of great benefits that come out of doing code review that aren't entirely clear just from everybody focusing on, well, I'm going to get, I'm, we're going to find bugs in this code review process, that kind of thing. I'm interested why you don't want to emphasize the difference in code quality that you get when you do code reviews. Why is that not, because to me that seems like the most obvious thing. Why is that not the, the big thing for you? It is an important thing, right? And so when you've done code review on code, it's going to have fewer defects. But there's a couple of problems I see with that. And the first is that if you tend to look at code as a way that people, if code reviews is a way of like, I submit a code review, people are going to find the bugs with it, right? It's easy for you to view code review negatively as like a thing where people are going to comb through your stuff and find where you did everything wrong, right? And that was actually my experience for many years doing code reviews. Is I dread them because I was like, I got why, attached. Why would, you, why would you view that negatively? Because I feel like it's a judgment on, it's easy, I feel this way, and I know other people do too, that like that is, can be seen as a judgment on your skill as a developer. Oh, okay, right? okay, yeah, because it's on you, it's on you. Right. Okay, yeah. Right. I've, I'm, I guess I'm just a freaky weirdo, but, well, we all knew this, but I love having people destroy my code. I, I learn so much, and I guess I've just been really lucky that every time I've gone through this, even just like a total, you know, 75 WTFs per minute, you know, meat <laughs> grinder code review, I've always felt like everybody in the room was on my side of the table trying to make the code better. Yeah, and I think that's true for some people and not true for other people. Um, so okay. I think you need to be careful with that, right? Some people yeah. just feel really piled on, particularly like if you're somebody new to a team and you get 75 comments on a pull request, right? That's, that's tough, Yeah, that's fair. Like. That is certainly part of it, right? So like when you find a bug in a code review, you need to point that out. The other reason why I, I think that we're kind of setting ourselves up for viewing code review as a failure if we stress finding bugs too heavily is that particularly with like these asynchronous pull request type reviews, we're looking at a small slice of a change. So if you make a change to some object in your system and there's some unit tests for it, you're like, all right, great, this seems to make sense. But unless you know entirely how that system is going to interact with the change you just made. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is that you can make like micro level judgments on the quality, like this line looks correct, right? But knowing how the entire system interacts requires you to know a lot about the application. And as applications grow, that's harder to necessarily know right off the bat, right? So you can judge that an individual change looks good based on the lines that you see, but not necessarily interactions. And that's why I think, particularly in languages like Ruby, Test coverage is really important to catch those. So like code review is going to help you, I feel like, more get towards the right solution, like an, a more interesting solution, a more flexible solution, that type of thing, than it is going to catch a bug. What we tend to catch in code reviews are edge cases, and studies have actually shown this. And edge cases are interesting, but they're not the truly dangerous stuff. Are you talking about stuff where someone says is looking at your code and they say, well, what if, what if X, Y happens? Right. What if what if this is nil? Like, what if I pass you something that's nil? Right. And it's like, oh, well, under ordinary circumstances, that wouldn't happen. But yeah, you're right. OK, I can guard against that. Right. And that's important. That's a bug that's caught. And now you can address that. But those tend to be edge cases like that aren't they're They're going to come up, but they're not the type of thing that's going to take your entire system down generally or at lead to corrupt data, that kind of thing. So I imagine that with larger systems, too, it's harder for one person to hold the system in their head. So having a group of code reviewers, maybe who have different familiarities with how different interactions take place, 
that would be a benefit as well. Right, exactly. So everybody's different. Everybody has different familiarity with the system, and also everybody has different like takes on how they think something should be done, or different expertise around like maybe I'm really good at SQL performance stuff, and I can tell you how to write that query better. And you know, Coraline, you're really good at web security, and you saw that I was doing something interesting with params that was probably not quite right. And you can give that kind of feedback. So having a whole team give varied and diverse feedback is interesting. And that's where, like, in the talk, I talk about having conflict on a team is good. And, and if you're not having any conflict, you've got, like, this monoculture where everybody's kind of doing things the same way all the time. And what you really want is a diversity of views. And that's going to lead to some conflict in how you approach different problems. But that's for the overall greater good. There's another, I guess for me at least, uh, value to code reviews, which is that when I'm doing something just on my own for a side project that no one's going to look at but me, you know, I just, I solve the problem and I move on. When I'm working on something that I know I'm going to get feedback on and I know it's going to be reviewed, I can kind of foresee the questions that my peers will ask and I'll ask myself that and then it'll inform my code. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's a difference in code quality that I've noticed in myself, not so much in terms of you know finding and squashing bugs, but just in terms of okay, if, you know if I if I put this in, then Derek is going to wonder why I did this, why didn't I do this, and then you know it kind of leads me down this thought process that I wouldn't get to if I didn't know it was going to be code reviewed. Have you experienced anything like that? Yeah, that's very well said. Uh, I think that's the exact experience I have when I'm writing code um, and preparing it for a review. Is like. I'll take one last look at the diff and I'll be like, oh, I feel like I'm pro- somebody's probably going to ask me why I did it this way, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. then I have to I have to answer myself, like, either do I have a good answer for that? If I do, let's go ahead and put that right in my pull request or in my commit so that, you know, they read that and they don't have to ask me because I, to- I explained it. If I don't have a good answer for that, why not? Is it something I should address now or is it something I feel like we should address later? And I'm going, like, either way, I'm going to address that in my pull request immediately out front o- or I'm just going to fix it, right? That type of thing. Exactly. Now, when I was introduced to code reviewing, it was typically this thing where you would get together in a conference room and somebody would put the code up on the wall and you'd all kind of go down through it at the same time. But it sounds like you're talking more about an asynchronous process. Do you prefer that asynchronous process? Yeah, I do. I've done the I've done the everybody in a room kind of thing, and I feel like that's effective in short bursts, and it's also instructive. Like I I have also been like more recently involved in teams where somebody will like, you know, a particularly interesting change from the last week that's probably already been merged, frankly. But like, let's go through it and let's see how they did this really interesting, how they solved this really interesting problem. That's like a tour of already completed code that's sort of like a code review. But I have done the like, okay, once a week or once a sprint or once a release cycle, we're all going to get in a room and we're going to put it up on the projector and we're going to go through line by line. Um, and I tend, to, I, I found that that got really boring <laughs> really quickly. Yeah, I always had trouble staying awake for those. Right, and everybody is kind of waiting on somebody. Like in those meetings, somebody tends to take the like the lead, right? And that person's the one that's commenting on everything. And you and like the people who are a little more tentative are just like, well, you know, so and so's handling this. I'll you know, I'll wait for them to say, see if he covers what I'm going to say or whatever. Right. And so I, I feel like the asynchronous thing works well. And it also, like, one of the things I stress in the talk is, like, the importance of realizing that because these are asynchronous, you're asking something of the people that are going to review them. Like, you're asking them to take a minute out from what they're doing or take five minutes or whatever from what they're doing to look at your change. So the things I say, like, when you're preparing a change for somebody to look at that you really want to do is keep them small, first of all, like, so that they're easy to review and easy to kind of keep track of what's going on in this change. And more importantly, also provide as much context about the change as you possibly can. Because a lot of times you'll end up, I'll be working on client projects and I'll get this giant PR that just has like a link to a ticket or maybe not even that, just like a summary of, and it's, and the summary is just like a restatement of exactly what was done in the code and not necessarily why this is changing. So without knowing why something's changing, it's really difficult to discern whether or not there's a better way to go about it or even really learn something from the change, right? If all I do in my change is essentially translate the code into pseudocode, if all I do in my change description is that, there's a real missed opportunity, I feel like. So those are the things that I think when you're doing asynchronous pull request reviews are particularly important to make sure you're sharing as much context with everybody as possible and keep them small so that, like I, I say in the talk also, like 10 minutes would be a really long time for me to spend on a code review. In actuality, like five minutes is probably the max I actually want to spend on a code review. And there's also like more interesting changes that have to be big for some reason or another are going to require more than that. But as a rule, five to 10 minutes is probably my max on a code review. I think those small changes, that's so important. I've talked about something called that I call um, pull request bombs, 
where you have a pull request, a single pull request that changes 500 lines of code. And there's that old joke that, you know, with a 10 line code review, you get 10 comments with 500 lines, you get no comments at all. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's, I've definitely, I made reference to that as well. Like you, with, with larger changes, what you see is like, either, like you said, there's no comments because nobody just wants to wade into it or like you badger enough people that somebody's going to finally look at it. And they look at it, and they start at the top, and they have a few comments, and then they scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's a comment and nothing in the middle, right? Because there's like, right. hey, there, I, fu- I fulfilled my responsibility. I looked at some of this, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and like I said, some changes are really difficult to make small. Uh, if you have like a large refactoring, right? And you can't make that small without committing a broken app. So what I tend to suggest there is that you actually take very small commit steps that can be consumed as one chunk and reviewed as one chunk. And yes, like some other part of the app is still is broken after this commit, but in your pull request, you're going to submit something where all the tests are green. And in each commit, you're going to step along the way and like tell a story with each one of those commits. So that in that case, when I'm reviewing a pull request like that, or if I'm submitting a pull request like that, I would say like, this is a pretty large refactor. Your best bet is to step through commit by commit. And unfortunately on GitHub, commenting on commits is not as nice as commenting on the actual pull request for various reasons, but it's still is going to make a better experience for everybody, I think, if you take that story approach with each commit in those cases. Now, I have kind of an allergic reaction to committing code where the tests break. Like It just makes my teeth itch. I would be fine coexisting in an environment where we did that, but I would be strongly tempted to like leave the old architecture in place and then replace it with new architectures, you know, piece by piece by piece, so that the old stuff is still there and then the new stuff gets built and th- that gets PR'd and then eventually you turn it on and switch over to the new stuff and you stay green. I'm wondering if three steps into a 10 PR process, do you run the risk of having people basically say, oh, you're architecting this completely wrong. You know, why not go back and do it this way? I, I, I wonder about the granularity starting to like, like you, you, you can lose the plot of the, where the 10 PRs are going. Does that make sense? Do you run into that problem? Yeah, that definitely happens. What I would say is when you're take, undertaking like a large change like that, typically this isn't just something that sprang from your head, right? Yeah, we're not doing waterfall development here. We're doing like requirements, design, all that stuff. But when you're going to embark on something that's going to take you five or 10 PRs to actually get through, typically you will have discussed the overall arc of arc. that story. <laughs> you will have discussed that with some other developers on your team and kind of gotten a little bit of buy-in, typically, correct? Sure. <laughs> I think that, okay. is, that is so critical because if you have an architectural disagreement about the way a pull request went, that seems like the at the end is the exact worst time to bring up that sort of difference at all. And there's there are times when, like, even just a one PR change, right? Like, so something simple where you're introducing a new model and there's going to be some sort of architectural disagreement with how that was done. That, I feel like, is a little more okay, right? Like, there's going to be some disagreement, and we're going to discuss, like, oh, well, did you consider doing it? You know, I might say, like, did you consider doing it this way that would require, you know, fewer associations or something like that? And I feel like that's okay because the change in itself, like, is still small, and, like, you you didn't spend a significant amount of time on it. But if you're in one of these, like, five to ten, if you're on this refactoring odyssey or this new architecture odyssey, it's really hard to get bogged down in like, you know, like David said, on the third step, somebody telling you like you're doing this all wrong, which is valuable feedback to have, but it would be nice to have from the beginning. And, you know, if, if you do find yourself in that situation, I would say like trying to see like, is it worth like, do we still have the right seams here that like I can make the types of changes that are being suggested later if it proves necessary? That type of thing is inter- it would be an interesting path to take. That's interesting because you just I just I just realized it, this, this is one of those things that where I cover my meds. We're doing the pull request and that style. And it's the first time that I've worked under this model. And so I'm still coming to grips with it. And you're exactly right. And I'm a little embarrassed that it's the answer to my own question because there's a, a service that is like, it's, it's one of our core services, internal and external clients all depend on it. And I need to make a major fundamental architectural change to it in order to get the one wafer thin change that I need out of it. And like it's an unauthenticated public service and I need to have a private authenticated internal only service. And so I went to the people that know the most about it and said, I need to add this. But in order to add this, I think it needs to have this huge architectural change done to it 
am I crazy or is this the right way? And they were like, mm, no, yeah, that's right. That, yeah, you're going to have to do all that crap. And you're right. We had like a half an hour discussion about how that would be architected and how the best way it would be. And then they patted me on the head and said, go do it. And, <laughs> you know, s- send us PRs. And right. you're right. I, I, I just realized that this worry about getting a, having a 10 PR arc and getting three commits in or three PRs into it and having people review it and say, you're doing it all wrong. Yes, you're in trouble. But in reality, you ran into trouble back at PR one when you didn't have a conversation with the other people about how this 10 PR arc was going to happen. Right. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And I, I do think that those are these are interesting things to think about, like, how are you going to handle these larger changes? But I also feel like day to day, that's not what we're working on. Usually, usually what we're working on is like fixing a bug, introducing a new model, introducing a new feature, that type of thing. And those are a lot easier to reason about, like keeping small, giving good context, that type of thing. And these larger changes, there's several different strategies, right? We identified like, you said you'd rather you'd rather build up like um, side like a, an architecture off to the side that's kind of not being used. And I, yeah. I commented that maybe maybe you just do it in a series of commits where you're actually breaking things along the way, but in the end the result is green and you squash those down. And, yeah. And, like at the end, right? Yeah. So there's all sorts of different I'm, ways you. Can I'm okay go with about. either. Yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of different ways you can go about these larger changes to kind there's of a, stay within the process. There's a thing that really struck me. Martin Fowler's refactoring book doesn't actually mention this explicitly, but if you read through each of the refactoring steps, they all say things like, like extract method says, copy the code you're going to extract and paste it into a new function and ensure that the code still compiles. Now extract the variables and ensure that there's, you know, and at no point does the code not work. And every single refactoring follows this pattern and I because Martin didn't give a name to it I I chose the name don't rip your britches uh, for the <laughs> pattern and and literally what I mean is you got one foot in the old code you got your other foot in the new code and you always want to ha- you when you're doing a refactoring you always want to have this moment when you have both codes in place and working so that before you turn off the old code, the new code is working. And if you step forward too far, if you if you remove the old code and then you have nothing that works and then you write the new code and you make it work, I call that ripping your britches, that you have that moment in time when no code works and solves the thing. And I would agree with you that if you want to plunge ahead and then go back and squash commits so that the PR is still green, I'm totally down with that. I'm totally fine with that. I like yeah, that name. And, yeah, it's a good name. Now that you've and explained I, it anyway, it makes a lot of sense. Well, if you draw on, on a whiteboard, like over time, you have two rows, right? And you basically have, and you just draw a bar graph of, here's the old code, and it's working over, it's working right up until we remove it. And then you take the new code in green, and you draw a bar graph of, of here's when we when we got it working, and here's it working on into the future. It's very obvious when you look at that graph that if those bars overlap, then at some point you had both codes working. And if the bars don't overlap, if there's a gap in between them, that's what I call ripping your britches. Is you've got this moment when your pants are down on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I always do feel better like when I follow when I follow a process that, that where that happens, it always does feel good, but I don't I think I'm probably just not disciplined enough all the time to end up doing that. So Derek, something that strikes me about code review when I think back of, uh, over my experiences with it, is that it can be very powerful both in, in, defecting, in <laughs> detecting defects, yes, in defecting, in just getting you know, feedback from other people, but on an interpersonal level, it can be pretty rough sometimes. I'm curious if you have any insights into making code review a supportive process. Yeah, absolutely. I talked about this a lot in the talk as well. I see lots of feedback that is well-intentioned in code reviews, but not necessarily well-phrased, I would say, or um, nicely put. <laughs> and I think what it comes down to is, especially when we're doing like written stuff with a pull request review, there's negativity bias in written communication. So if I give you some feedback and I write it down for you, you're going to perceive that one way. But if I give you that same exact feedback and I say it to you, even just over you know a voice call or something like that, or face to face, which would be even better. You're going to perceive that like much better. Like j- just having the conversation and the tone in your voice softens the feedback or softens the conversation that you're you're having. 
when you write that very same thing down, it does come off much more harsh. And it's very much more subject to like the mood that the person reading it is in, that kind of thing. Um, so I talk about this a little bit in the talk that I gave and suggest that instead of saying, like, oh, uh, do this, like issuing a command saying, like, extract this, extract a service here because you've got some duplication, that type of thing. Um, just softening that just a little bit to kind of ask a question to try to enter into a discussion rather than issuing a command. So you could say, like, what do you think about this solution instead? Or did you consider this other thing? Rather than giving your feedback as a series of commands, trying to, like, open up a discussion to see, like, well, did you already think about this? Uh, why didn't you do that? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. Versus just giving the command. That's essentially bringing in Socratic method, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I mentioned that as well. And yeah. so, like, what, what we're trying to do is ask questions so that we have a good discussion around why the solution exists as it does. Versus, like, if I issue a command and you, you either are just going to be like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And maybe you don't feel that great about it, or maybe you're just going to ignore me, or you're not going to, like, whatever the case may be. Asking the question is going to lead more to a better result, right? And I find this time and time again when I'm doing code reviews with clients is a lot of times on more established companies, what I do a lot of is reviewing code. And when I'm, you know, doing my 15th code review of the morning, it can be really tempting for me to just kind of forget about that whole thing that I talk about often and just start issuing commands. And then I, re- I catch myself, and in the next one, I'm like, okay, get back to like being nice, right? Uh, soften mm-hmm. this feedback a little bit with some questions and enter into a discussion. And every single time, the discussion is better when I start asking questions. So that would be the number one yeah. thing I think that people can do when they're giving feedback is to stop issuing commands and instead yeah. ask probing questions. And you can, yeah. still, you can still shape the discussion in the way you want to go with the questions that you ask. If I can make a suggestion, there's a specific three-word trigger that I highly recommend people just memorize these three words and never let yourself say them. And those three words are, why didn't you? You know, why didn't you? And then insert a uh, preferred solution here. And the reason why is because when you say, why didn't you? It's actually a complicated verbal linguistic hairball because you are, you're presupposing a whole bunch of things. You're presupposing that you know, when I say, why didn't you X, it entails, you didn't do X, you should have done X, I, who am judging your code, obviously think it, you know, thinks it's obvious to everyone that you should have done X, and I would like you to explain to to us all why you didn't do it, you know, that kind of thing, and, and so you get very defensive very quickly, and the thing is, is you can ask that same question, you can ask, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you use the visitor pattern here, you can just come around with that and just say, seems like the visitor pattern would have been a little more efficient here. Would that have been, you know, did, did you consider that or would that have been something? And then that gives them, it takes them off the defensive. And if they genuinely didn't, because if you ask somebody, why didn't you use the visitor pattern? And their answer is, oh, I didn't even think of that. Now they look really dumb. And it's very much one up, one down conversation where you're one up and they're kind of in a one down position. And if you're like, would visitor pattern have been better here? It, then if they if it would have, they can go, oh, man, that's a great idea. I can take it. Or if they actually have a legitimate defense, instead of bristling their defense with, well, the visitor pattern obviously requires da, 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 they can actually come back quietly and calmly and say, yeah, I thought about visitor pattern, but I didn't have this, you know, this in place to support that. And so this trade-off would have been more inefficient. And you can go, oh, yeah, you're right. That would have been less inefficient. And you can go on down. And so, so yeah, why didn't you is is a great – it's a great phrase that I encourage people to just develop an, an allergy to if they can. Yeah. Okay, I have a, a question for that. <laughs> yeah. Can I instead say something like, well, did you consider using yeah. this pattern? Is that Yeah, better? absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. How do people feel about leading with, that's interesting? I love that's interesting. Oh, it's like mm-hmm. my go-to phrase. It's amazing. I hadn't considered yes. that. Give me, like, so, so. Let's say my first, my first knee-jerk reaction is, that's stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't say that's stupid. But instead, I say, that's interesting. And in the time that I buy myself to say, that's interesting, I also begin to think about why somebody might have, you know, legitimately chosen that course. And it also, I feel like yeah. it can also have a softening effect on that, you know, why didn't you or or have you con- had you considered mm-hmm. question that you might follow it with. I would often follow that's interesting with, 
because you do. You want to ask why didn't you do this obvious X, right? What's wrong Things with like, you? That, yeah, exactly. What, what is what is your deal? That's interesting. Followed and and you got nothing, right? You, you're like, okay, I bought myself some time. And now I need to ask why they didn't just use the visitor pattern. And so, so you say, that's interesting. I might have used the visitor pattern here had you considered that. And, and so you can say, I mm-hmm. might have used, you know, that's interesting. I might have used. I will say, if you use the word fascinating, period, it will come across as sarcastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, ask me how I know. <laughs> A lot of what we've talked about is putting the emphasis on the reviewer, but what kind of qualities does the reviewee need to have to make code review effective? The reviewee being the person who submitted it? Yes. Yeah, um, I think it's important to like try and realize that no matter how the things are phrased, people are generally trying to help, right? So it's great if everybody does what we were just talking about, where they soften their feedback. If you're continually having a problem with people giving this harshly worded feedback, maybe point them to this discussion or other discussions that kind of coach them along to give more effective feedback. But if you're having your code reviewed, you need to look at it more on the, like, this isn't a judgment on me. Like what I said earlier is like, I think it's easy for people to think that it's a judgment on them. Um, but this isn't necessarily a judgment on you. And through this whole, like, if everybody's asking questions, now you're doing this discussion, you're having this discussion, which I feel like is rewarding right off the bat, even if you disagree, right? You're like, now we're going to talk about the visitor pattern to keep hammering on that, right? And uh, maybe I'm going to learn something, or maybe I'm going to teach David something about why the visitor pattern is a bad fit here or whatever, right? And these are much more rewarding things to get into than, like, the why didn't you just kind of thing. Other things oh, that yeah, you can do... Yeah, just. Just is yeah. Why didn't you just is a the just is a times ten multiplier on the why didn't you? <laughs> because right. it really it, it makes it explicit that you think it was obvious. And Derek, right. and you then, have a section. You have an entire section in your talk where you talk about the word just. Yes, and the statement that David made earlier about why didn't you was basically the entire entirety of it. Only I also included why didn't you just right. And that actually got a really good reaction from uh, Ryan Davis was in the crowd. He was very happy to hear somebody say, stop saying, why didn't you just? And going back to, again, to like what you can do is somebody having, I, I guess this is both people doing the review and people having their code reviewed is at some point you're going to have to say like, you can both say that's interesting at each other, but you're going to need to ship some code at some point. So you're not always going to have come to like 100% agreement on everything. So realizing that and saying like, okay, I, I hear what you're saying about the visitor pattern. I think this is a simpler solution for right now. What do you think about going with this for now and revisiting if we need to make a change to this? That kind of thing. So like looking for those ways to kind of agree to disagree versus just talking circles around each other for weeks while this thing doesn't get merged. I mean, weeks is is an overstatement, but maybe a day or two, right? Versus like this could just be a conversation that we say, okay, yeah, we both made some good points here. Let's table it and let's go with one of these solutions for now and we'll come back to it, right? Yeah. I have a a very important question that's been bothering me this whole hour. When I look at the slides from your talk, Mm -hmm. on the fourth slide, and I think the fifth and the sixth as well, there's a picture of bugs. And I just need to know, are those real bugs? Are those fake bugs? Because they look disgusting. I I believe that they are real. At the very end, there is photo credits at the very end of the talk. And uh-huh. I got all those off Flickr, so you can oh. you can look that up and see. That makes me very sad. Um, okay. I do believe they're real, and several people told me that they they were disgusted by those. Because yes, <laughs> they're like this really bright orange. So I thought, oh, maybe these are just like made of clay. I don't know. I was being optimistic, but no, they're real. okay. The brighter the colors of the insect, the more poisonous and venomous it is. Oh, basically, no. that's right. I yeah. didn't think about that part. Sorry, maybe I'll have that's to soften right. that image for the. Um, <laughs> I, I used to run a photo site called Insect Pod, which was the insect picture of the day, and I, I learned a lot about macro photography, and I also learned that uh, nobody wants to look at pictures of insects every day. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, how successful thought? was that site? Yep. So, yeah, the, site, the site's down and long gone to the loss of the history, but I had some fascinatingly disgusting photos. It was awesome. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about code reviews and why they're good, but let's say you're at a company that doesn't currently do code reviews. How do you even get started with instituting that as part of the baked-in culture? Yeah, I've seen this go one of two ways, right? Uh, In my case, when I first started doing code reviews, it was like top-down. We have to do this because we need to generate this documentation for compliance. 
that type of thing. And that ended up being toxic for a few years because I just resented the whole process, right? The other way I've seen it done is like a senior developer on the team just decides that, okay, we're all doing pull request reviews starting now, right? And that can be equally toxic from a perspective of like, oh, this person who thinks that like they're the leader of the team said we have to do it this way. So now we're, you know, everything has to be approved by them, that kind of thing. What I would suggest doing instead is if you want to do code reviews, just start doing them on your code, right? Just start saying, like, oh, I've, I've, uh, I got this change here. When you get a second, could you take a look through it? Or, like, maybe, maybe go through it with somebody. Like, if you know the type of feedback that you want to hear, like, just have them sit down and actually at the pull request screen in GitHub start going through and be like, what do you think about what I did here? Like, kind of coach the process a little bit. And we've had some success in that, like where we'll go on to more established teams, maybe just one or two of us from ThoughtBot to a more established team. We'll make sure we're doing code reviews on all of our stuff. We'll encourage pull requests to be opened by other people and we'll give good feedback there. And it's important, I think, when you're dealing with like newcomers to pull requests to not bombard people with feedback, like try and keep the feedback like at a high value, very high level kind of thing, like to bring them along and like kind of get them used to the process a little bit, give them some quick early wins and be sure like you're saying, if you're going to review somebody's code, who may be not entirely bought into this process, right? Maybe they're afraid of being exposed to somebody who doesn't know as much as they should or whatever, right? They have some sort of imposter syndrome going on, right? Like we all do. Then being sure to say like, Oh, this is really in this and not in a way of like, that's interesting. Here's an alternative, but being like, Hey, that's really interesting. I didn't know you could do that. That's great. Like I'm going to do that next yeah. time I come across this problem. So like not just giving critical feedback, but also giving praise. So if you start really small by just like kind of <laughs> being the change you want to see in your organization, right? Um, and trying to win friends that way. Or win people over to your side that way mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. kind of saying like hey we've been doing this for the last few weeks and like i've i've noticed some really interesting benefits what do you think if for the next month we all tried to do pull requests and pull request reviews that type of thing rather than having it be a commandment that comes from either on high or like your most senior coworker or something like that it tends to work a little yeah. better in my experience yeah yeah, right. Finding something positive in the code review is really, it's a good way to, to, to really invest emotionally, uh, in the other person and, and, the, and make it clear that you're trying to improve the quality of the code, not, you know, tear them down. We had a test engineer that just wrote on a pull request in one of the specs. She, she wrote, OMG, I love it when people write specs like this. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, Holy crap, that's a thing you can totally write on some on a pull request. You don't have to just tear everything down. Right. Yeah, it's great to see that. And like at my at the last client I worked with, they had seen this talk after I gave it and then I continued to work with them some more. And at that point they knew what I was doing, right? By <laughs> they knew all my secrets, right? But it didn't matter. It still had the same effect, like being nice, asking questions, it still had the same effect of like spurring conversation, making people feel better about their changes. And I'm not like when I'm giving compliments, I'm not it's not entirely out of like, OK, I'm going to give a compliment here and then I'm so that I can like be a little more negative down here. Like, yeah, right. that, that's a that's a benefit. But it's also like I just want to give people credit for doing something that I didn't like teaching me something or doing something really interesting or whatever. Just acknowledging that like, hey, this is a difficult problem and this is a really good solution for it or an interesting solution, that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, assuming you do have a team's buy-in for code reviews, how do you just make sure that it gets done? I mean, maybe some people really enjoy doing it. In my experience, it's always been kind of one of these overhead things that are harder to get people to do. Like one team I worked on, we had uh, basically like uh, once a month or once an iteration or something, we would select a new person who was expected to spend less time coding, but more time going over pull requests and code reviewing them. I mean, do you have strategies for making that a regular part of the, the team's process? Yeah, I found it successful to try and make it a little less of a process. And especially if you can keep if you can keep people working in the mindset of having small changes that are quick to review, that type of thing. For us anyway, it works out pretty well to do like some reviews in the morning of stuff that came in yesterday that you didn't get to. Maybe some review maybe a review or two right before lunch, maybe a review or two right before you get coffee or right after you go and get coffee in the afternoon. And then maybe right before you go home, right? There's all these natural breaks in our work, like when we're about to pick up something new or, you know, we have a test suite that God forbid takes five whole minutes, right? Or uh, something like that. You're going to, you need some, something to do to occupy that time. Or you just need a break from what it is you were pounding your head on for the last 
hour and a half or whatever and not making much progress with. So that's the process we typically try to favor is just like very asynchronous, very like when you have a pull request, put it in Slack, somebody will click on it and give you a review. And you're waiting for typically one review. If it's a big change, maybe you'll want a couple people to take a look at it. And you're waiting just for like one thumbs up or one approval and then you move on. And having having it be very lightweight and not bogged down in that process works at least in my experience, better than having like a, a set person that's going to be more, most responsible for the reviews or like there were people at RailsConf talking to me about a process that they were in where like you needed two thumbs up to ship anything. But if somebody gave a one thumbs down, then that counted. That was a blocker and you had to get them to clear the thumbs down. And there were all these like rules that they had <laughs> around like what counts for what. And like what I keep coming back to is this is just a discussion about code. Code is mostly trade offs. If the problem isn't with like, some gross quality problems, then at some point you just got to kind of be like, okay, interesting. We'll revisit this kind of thing. So trying to make sure you don't enter into those like spirals of this isn't the way I would do it kind of thing saves yeah. that time as well. So. Now, do you, do you like, do you tag someone to do the review for you or do people just pick a pull request to review or what? Depends on the size of the team, really. Sometimes if I'm on a team that's a larger team where I know that, uh, for instance, Colin or whoever on the team is like really most familiar with this code, I will just put the pull request out for a general review, like in the chat or whatever. And then maybe I will also follow it up with like, Colin, it'd be great to get your thoughts on that because I know that, you know, you dealt with this code a lot three weeks ago or whatever the case may be. But act, I'm, I'm actively trying, like one of the benefits I think of having everybody kind of try and take a look at code reviews is that you start to get like you start to share this knowledge. It's no longer like, oh, Derek and Colin know that area of the code. So, you know, when they're on vacation, uh oh. It's more of like everybody has seen this code go in. We kind of all said, like, yeah, that looks reasonable, that kind of thing. So trying not to do that. And also like I've seen situations where like only the senior people on teams do reviews and I think you really need to try and get the junior people involved in those as well. And I think, you know, doing the things we talked about today, like not being negative, asking questions, that type of thing makes it a more welcoming environment for them to do yeah. that. We use a a semi-formal it's 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 like a, it, it's an informal process but it's like officially informal <laughs> at cover my meds where you need an lgtm which is a looks good to me comment from somebody who didn't write the code and we will usually just go into our team room and just say hey can i get a thumbs up on this you know can i some eyes on this pr and the only time we will tag somebody is if we are really deep in the bowels of something that's highly specialized and we know somebody else used to work on that. You know, we'll say, Hey, can somebody look at this? Also, you know, at, you know, Ryan, you know, can you maybe take a look at this? That kind of thing. And we'll also tag somebody just like a random person on the team if we want to fast track it because they get a notification that, Hey, you just got mentioned about this. And, yeah. you know, then they can say, Oh yeah, I can jump on that. Yeah, and the, I think those are two great cases for tagging somebody, right? Like, you know that there's some intimate system knowledge here that, like, this person has, and it'd be great to have them look at it, or you really need to get this, like, out there. It's a bug in, in production. You need to ship it. Yep. I'm in a situation where the person who knows a lot of the really, where a lot of the bodies are buried in our code has been promoted to uh, management to another team. And so we will tag him occasionally just to let him know that uh, his promotion means nothing to us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> At Instructure, we have a we have a pretty formal process. We use a tool called Garrett, and it basically requires a plus two before any code can ship to QA. And QA has to plus to it, and product has to plus to it, and only at that point is it even physically possible to merge which I think a formal process has some advantages, but it definitely has some of the disadvantages you're talking about too. Yeah, you gotta, you, you have to, you kind of have to weigh things for the organization that you're in, right? And at ThoughtBot, I'm working with a lot of generally smaller organizations. Sometimes it's just like me and another ThoughtBot developer and a ThoughtBot designer, right? So we have a smaller team and we're not, <laughs> I, I don't want to have like a restrictive process. I don't want to have like rules on where these JIRA cards can go, that kind of thing. But as your team gets bigger, sometimes those things make sense. I would say, waiting until they absolutely like you have evidence that this need like this is a problem that needs to be fixed with process rather than like changing some habits is probably a prudent thing there but i mean you have to make sense you have to do what makes sense for your organization right are you aware of other tools that come in handy doing code reviews or is there anything you'd recommend 
Yeah, I mean, I talk about this a little bit. I, I would say um, one of the things people get a lot of comments on or leave a lot of comments on is style. Like if you're, if you're on a team that has a style guide or maybe you don't actually have a written style guide, you just have like somebody who really cares about writing the code the, the, the way that they would have written it, right? That type of feedback I think is important. Like if you, particularly if you do have an adopted style guide, I think it's important that people try and follow it where it makes sense. But there's been studies that show like feedback on that type of thing in a code review tends to be looked on negatively because it's like, oh, you're harping on these little style things. What do you think about what I actually did? That kind of thing. So right. in in Ruby, we're lucky to have like we have um, I'm blanking on the name of Rubocop. So Rubocop, you can give it some style guide rules and it's going to look at your code and do that for you. Um, we also have like JS Hint will do the same for JavaScript and we have you know SAS Lint will do the same for your SAS code. Um, so there's all sorts of tools you can do to like not have people reviewing code worrying about what the style looks like. This is the part where I have I'm going to plug a service that <laughs> Thoughtbot sells called Hound, and I do so of my own volition because <laughs> I think it's a good tool and it's it's like twelve dollars a month or something like that for a private repo. But it will take those rules and those all of those linters we just discussed and run them and give you comments as if you know it was a person commenting on the pull request that you can either take or leave. It's not going to fail a build for you that kind of thing. Oh, cool. Um, and it's just going to, you can either take it or leave it. But again, it's like a, a way to discuss. So like if after we introduce Hound on Teams, what we start to see is like people have discussions with the robot that has left the feedback, which I think is actually really <laughs> good. Like that's what I want to see. I want you to explain to me, if you're not going to follow a style rule, I, I want you to explain why you shouldn't follow the style rule, right? Because it's just a robot leaving that feedback. It's not like, maybe you feel negatively towards the robot, but it doesn't really matter. Right, I, um, I could make you want to kill that robot because I would totally <laughs> program the robot to say, "Fascinating. Why didn't you just co- truncate the characters?" <laughs> like any moron would do- know to do. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, I think tools like that. See, obviously, having CI that runs tests, I think, is very important because, like I said, I'm not necessarily going to be able to catch these like how the system interacts type bugs. Having something like code climate can also be valuable to see like I, I find it most valuable in a situation where something is improved because code climate's like, hey, the changes in this pull request move this file from a C to a B or whatever. And that's actually really gratifying feed. That's another form of like getting nice feedback, right? So I think tools like that, any anything you can automate, I think is worth it. I'm curious about Hound now. How configurable is that to reflect the styles of an individual organization? Very. It, it depends on what Rubo... I mean, Hound is running RuboCop. For for Ruby code, it's running RuboCop. I see. Code. So whatever you can configure in RuboCop, you can configure in Hound. The same for it, for JavaScript, it's running JSN. So you, whatever you can do in JSN, you can do in, in Hound. That type of thing. And cool. you, can turn, you can turn different things off and on or whatever. It's configurable to whatever you need. We've been talking a lot about code review in the context of Teams. Uh, but I can imagine that there are probably some people listening who uh, are working alone, or uh, maybe they're just getting started and they, they aren't lucky enough to be on a team yet, uh, and they're wishing they could get some of that code, that good code review feedback. Um, are there any resources out there, any ways for people to experience code review when they're not working with a team? I am not aware of any. <laughs> There's somebody that's aware of some. I think it's a great idea, like trying to find, trying to buddy up with somebody. Go ahead. This is David that's oo ooing Exorcism.io. Oh, it's sure. it's yeah. nothing but code review. I mean, yeah, it's it's katas, but I mean the katas are like 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 brain dead stupid, right? It's it's like uh like like the first one, the the, the Bob example is just like you know Bob's a teenager, and if you ask him a question, he's like whatever, and you have to write a class that returns whatever, and you know that you know on based on on like these three rules, and. I went like seven freaking iterations on that thing with Katrina saying, well, what about this? Why did you consider this? And have you considered trying to – and I'm like, holy crap, are you actually going to make me write good design in this code? <laughs> and the answer was yes, yes, she was. <laughs> yeah, I do so, think, yeah, I do think tools like that are great, but I, I, I also think it's really valuable when it comes down to like getting whatever project you are working on actually reviewed because that's when you're going to start applying maybe some of the things that you got back in those katas or in stuff that you read in sandy metz's book or whatever the case may be so i think getting the actual applied stuff would be yeah yeah be the best feedback so like trying to trying to find somebody like if you're a freelancer finding another freelancer or things like that i've also thought about like just like on a friday being like hey do you have a code do you have code to review i'll do that for you but obviously that doesn't scale particularly well um so i start though 
yeah, I may you have to start meet new friends trying too. to right start doing some stuff, um, stuff like yeah. that. I don't know. I think Avdi, didn't you have like a service at one point? Am I misremembering that was like maybe it was for pair programming? Oh, pair with me, yeah. Pair program with dot me is not a service. It is just a res- uh, page with a whole lot of resources on it for different ways of remotely pairing with people and finding people to pair with and stuff like that. Yeah, I would say yeah. like that same type of thing. It's not pairing, but it's like asynchronously reading somebody else's code and getting to learn from it. I think that type of like looking at systems like looking at people who are interested in remote pairing is probably a good way to find somebody who might be interested in doing some remote code reviews for you. One of the things that we started doing, I think like uh, a few weeks ago at Code Newbie, is we started having these evening study sessions. So we have on Monday we do Ruby, on Tuesday we have JavaScript, and on Thursday, we have Python. And what we started doing is having team projects. And that, the whole code review, pull request, team collaboration part is like the focus of those projects. So, you know, JavaScript is doing like a hangman game, which is relatively simple. But in the process of doing that, like we have a Trello board and we're organizing our feature cards by priority. You have to get the thumbs up before you can merge in your pull request. And for a lot of people, you know, who've been mostly learning on their own and doing things, you know, just by themselves, it's a really interesting opportunity to say, okay, now I have to know what a pull request is and how to name my branches and how to respond and how to communicate. And we did that exactly, you know, for that reason. And it's it's a huge skill. Like there's I think there's, you know, just knowing how to code and good design patterns and that, but then working on a team collaboratively to ship product is a whole other skill set that I think is hard to pick up when you're learning on your own. That's fantastic to, to pick a, a simple project and and just put in all of the process and the overhead where, yeah, you're basically just practicing the process and the overhead, right? I mean, the, exactly. the, the, the code itself is pretty simple. There's a, a really good motto that I heard about a year ago, and it, it just keeps coming up over and over again. And the, of all places, I think it's from the Navy SEALs. But the, the motto is, go slow to go smooth, go smooth to go fast. And I, I really like that, that motto of let's take some code where we're not panicking. We're not trying to get this shipped to keep the company from going bankrupt. All we're trying to do is just practice our process and make sure that everything is going out and coming back right and the way it needs to do. And once you start to get in the habit of, you know, write the code, push the commit, ask for the PR, wait for the, P- the LGTM, then it merged the code, da 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 da. Yeah, then now you start to get smooth and now you can start to go fast. Sounds perfect. That's pretty awesome. All right. Well, does anyone ha- else have any questions for Derek? I'm good. I think this has been a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah hey, thanks for having me. Let us get into the picks. Saran, so do you have any picks today? Yes, I do. So the first one is two interviews that we did recently on the Code Navy podcast that I'm so excited about. We had Sandy Metz on, and she was so phenomenal and so honest and open and incredibly accessible. Um, and it was so good. We actually broke it up into two pieces, so episodes 41 and 42. I'd love for everyone to check that out. The second one is, do you guys know the YouTube series, If Google Was a Guy? No, <laughs> but I'm not <fascinated. laughs> Oh, I love when I know YouTube videos that people don't know. So it's called If Google Were a Guy. I think there are a couple of them. I've only seen the first one, but I think there's like two or three versions. It's so funny. It has Google and, you know, personified as this, he kind of looks like a college professor. And you come in with your request and he gives you the results and just the reaction and the story. It's just, it's really funny. It makes, um, it makes kind of the end user look dumb, but, you know, I think it's justified. Uh, so definitely check that out. It's absolutely hilarious and incredibly accurate. So those are my picks. I need to make a video of me trying to use OK Google to get it to understand <laughs> my voice. I have yet. <sighs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> I totally second the uh, the Sandy Metz interview pick. I uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you. All right, Coraline, any picks? Yeah, I have one pick today. I am so excited about this. Basically, Lego has this mechanism by which people can pitch a Lego set to be developed, and people can vote on it. And if it gets a certain number of votes, it actually gets designed as a set. And there's a proposed set right now to celebrate Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. December 10th of this year marks the 200th anniversary of Ada Lovelace's birth. And she, of course, is one of my namesakes. So this project would be a great commemoration of the bicentenary and potentially inspire a new generation of computer programmers because there's a capacity in the model, in the Lego model, to house a mini computer like a Raspberry Pi. 
which I think is the most amazing idea. Um, the brick set is monochromatic to evoke a Victorian accent, uh, atmosphere, and the engine's sort of cyberpunk looking. It's pretty cool looking. Um, but I think the, uh, the thing that sells this for me is including a Raspberry Pi and making that available to kids and getting them excited about programming, as excited as Lovelace and Babbage were in their time. Um, so I think that's pretty awesome. So I'm going to put a link to the voting link and the description of the set, including pictures in the show notes. How about you, David? Okay, so I promised only one pick, and so I'm going to make good on that, and that is Cover My Meds. We have a, an intern program, and it's full, and we are still looking for really high-quality Rubius, and so we have decided to try to do something unusual, which is to poach from other verticals of our industry. <laughs> so we are looking for... Java programmers and .NET programmers that have really strong engineering skills. Uh, sorry that I mean we every, right now the big push in the Ruby community is to to bring up newbies as much as we can, and we do have a co-op program, uh, like I said, and it, it's full, and we still need more really sharp engineers because we are just riding a tiger right now. We are uh, we are saving people's lives, and it turns out that people want that. And it's absolutely fantastic. So we did a publicity stunt. We hung up what we think is the largest Ruby logo in the world. It's 50 feet tall. It's it's one of those, it's like, is it a billboard? Is it a building? You know, is it a bird? Is it a plane? That kind of thing. It is <laughs> it is a billboard that covers the entire side of an entire skyscraper. Well, I say skyscraper. It's like 120 feet tall. And the billboard just flat out says it's the largest Ruby logo in the world. It's also accidentally the largest Java logo because it's a cup of coffee with a Ruby in the middle of it. And uh, the logo is uh, come get a better cup of coffee. And we are, you know, definitely looking for, you know, Java and .NET programmers. If you are interested in this uh, or if you know someone who is, please feel co- free to contact me on Twitter at dbrady. Or the billboards it has the the URL right on it, and I will give that here, which is covermymeds.com forward slash Ruby. That's the, the landing page where you can come learn more about this and find out uh, what we're looking for and whether or not you'd be a good fit for us. Um, but the long and short of it is the prior authorization request mechanism for insurance companies is completely broken, and we are fixing it. And we are getting people the meds, medications that they need by forcing their med- their insurance providers to actually pay for them when they should. And that's freaking awesome. And uh, we're saving people's lives. And I get to quit work every day feeling like I did something important. And if you are working in Java or .NET and you want that sense of fulfillment and you would like to switch to Ruby, we are basically doing... Uh, I should have said this at the very beginning. What we're doing is a series of boot camps on Ruby on Rails for people who already are expert in another software language. It's not just Java or .NET. If you are, you know, if you're a Haskell Haskell guru or you know Erlang, definitely come talk to us because we're definitely interested. So, the number one question I'm getting asked by people on Twitter is, do you have to work in Columbus, Ohio, at the headquarters, or can you work remote? And the answer is yes. You can work from anywhere that you can see the sign, and I can see the freaking thing from Utah. So, yes, remote is okay. That's my pick. I want to see this billboard. How do I see it? Uh, I will post a picture uh, okay. here in the chat and, in, and into the show notes, and um, I will also uh, post the link for the show notes. Awesome. All right, Derek, what about you? Do you have any picks? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to selfishly plug uh, Bikeshed.fm again. That's the podcast I host with uh, with uh, Sean Griffin. Um, if you like this podcast, if you like Code Newbies, you might like that, so check it out. And then for picks, the first thing I have here is the Ember RFC process, which is not a, a software pick, but just an idea. In Ember, if they're going to make a large change to the framework, it goes through this RFC process that gets comments. And I wish very much that Rails had something like this for things like Action Cable. Unfortunately, it does not. I very much admire the way a lot of the Ember project itself is run, and I think the RFC process is one of the ways that is one of the things that's really interesting about it. My second pick would be this thing called Totally, and if you're going to Google it, replace the L's with ones. So it's Tote A11Y, and that A11Y is for accessibility. So I went to a talk from Chandra Carney at Rails when I was at RailsConf, and it made me realize how very little I know about accessibility, despite having been a web developer for 15 plus years. 
And I've been really interested in how to get better at accessibility. So this this tool called Totally, it can run as a bookmarklet or you can include the script in your development server. And it will run some accessibility audits on your page for you and give you a little icon in the lower left that you click and it'll give you the re- results from that audit. And it'll tell you things like you're missing labels on these form fields or, um, you know, your link text is very generic, which is like click here. Link text is not particularly helpful to screen readers or your heading. Your headings are like don't follow the proper cascading things like that. So it's a really interesting tool to play around with and learn more about accessibility. And my final pick is a talk on how to, per- it's called How to Performance, and it's by Eileen Uchitel. And she gave it at uh, Goruko, um, which was recently, a couple weeks ago, I think. And I really admire the people who do like the down in the weeds performance work, and she's one of those people doing that work. And I've always been like confused, I guess, as to how to get into it myself. And this is a good talk that kind of goes through exactly what she did to do some benchmarking on a Rails change that she was doing, and then how to get a baseline and what to do with that information once you have it, that type of thing. So uh, I really enjoyed that. Cool. All right, cool. Well, um, I uh, I have a couple of picks. Actually, uh, Derek totally stole one of my picks um, because it was going to be the Bike Shed podcast, which I do listen to um, on the occasions that I, I managed to listen to podcasts. I used to listen to this one this one Ruby podcast, but now all they talk about is like Elm and closure and stuff like that, weird stuff. So, <laughs> Bike Said's kind of cool because they they still get into technical stuff in, in about Ruby and Rails, and uh, it's a good podcast. I've enjoyed it. I, I will also pick uh, my new camera. Uh, this is a, a camera that I, I I asked for for my birthday, and my wife got it for me. Actually, gave it to me a bit early. I realize now that I live in the woods, I'm wanting to take pictures of things more often than I used to, and the sensor in my my uh, Nexus 6 phone is actually really good, uh, so I'm pretty much covered for like close stuff and pictures of my kids and stuff like that. Uh, it's really the, the long-range zoom shots that I was missing out on, uh, so I went, but I, I what I really didn't want to do is I didn't want to get into back into photography as a hobby. I did that when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I kind of got that out of my system. Um, I, I really didn't want to sort of open up that money hole again. So I did not go for the micro four thirds system or anything like that. Um, what I got is a, is an Olympus SP 100 EE, which is basically it's a point, a fancy point and shoot camera with a monstrous zoom lens on it. Uh, it doesn't have quite the sensor quality of a proper DSL, but it's good enough. And, uh, it has great, like, like I said, it has this great zoom lens. It has great, uh, lens stabilization and it has this brilliant feature that, that currently no other cameras have, which is a dot sight, a laser dot sight, like you will see in, um, on some firearms, which it's hard to explain, but basically you can look through this space at the top of the camera and the dot always, through fancy optics, the dot always falls where the, the lens is pointed, pointed, even if your eye is not perfectly lined up with it. And the great thing about that is with a long, long zoom lens, a lot of times if you lose your target, you have to zoom all the way back out to refind it and then zoom back in again. And the dot sight enables you to zoom in and then keep the lens on your target without going through that process. So you can actually catch, you know, shots of birds flying and stuff like that uh, without that whole, that whole rigmarole. So yeah, I've been, I've really been enjoying it. Um, again, it's not like, don't, ex- if you get it, don't expect like the, the great, the most perfect D- uh, DSLR quality shots but I'm totally getting shots that I was missing before. I'm really looking forward to taking it to Cades Cove and getting pictures of the bears that aren't just like little little black blobs in the distance where where you say, I swear, this is a bear. I promise you. <laughs> um, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it also takes some some great macro photos, and generally it's it's been working pretty well for me. So uh, those are my picks. And uh, I think that about wraps up our show. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Once again, this episode was sponsored by Braintree, so go check them out at Braintree.com. If you need any kind of credit card processing or payment processing in general, they are a great way to go, and we appreciate them sponsoring the show. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. 
Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join the conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor.